people have never, ever been able to understand what is being communicated to them in writings. And, you know, and we're all the same. It's, it's even what the Jesus of the Bible said. They look and look, but they don't see. They listen and they listen, but they don't understand. People, let me give you an example. There is an extremely famous children's story that you're all familiar with. You've either read the book or you've seen the movie. It's called Alice in Wonderland. If there ever was a classic, that's it. Alice in Wonderland. Even Disney has... A, a pavilion in his in the place for Alice in Wonderland. But let me tell you something. The writer of Alice in Wonderland was a guy named Lewis Carroll. Today he would be known as a strange dude. And when somebody like that sits down and writes this story. We can't wait to grab our kids and take them by the hand and lead them in to see Alice in Wonderland. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, don't you see? As long as nobody knows what the story's about, what harm can it do? As long as nobody knows they're not part of the code that's being transmitted in the story. Did you enjoy Alice Rodney? Oh, yes, I like the Cheshire cat. Well, just as people read the Bible today, they read Alice in Wonderland in the same way. They take away from it what is seems to be nice and pretty and everything, and they haven't a clue what it's about. I'd ask you a question. Let me show you a scene. You tell me. What, pray tell, is that caterpillar sitting on top of the mushroom smoking? Oh, and that's a big part of it, isn't it? If you notice, it's very interesting because it says A, E, I, O, and U, the vowels. But we've got ourselves something really special. We've got magic mushrooms, don't we? And we've got a caterpillar who is going to experience a metamorphosis from crawling on the ground to flying off in a coat of many colors smoking away, and what the heck is in there? And what happens to dear little Alice when she follows the caterpillar's instructions to take a bite from the magic mushroom? Or as they called it in the Bible, the heavenly manna. Let's look. Yeah. Then the caterpillar got down off of the mushroom and crawled away in the grass, merely remarking as it went, one side will make you grow taller and the other side will make you grow shorter. One side of what? The other side of what, thought Alice to herself. Of the mushroom, said the caterpillar just as if she had asked it aloud. And in another moment, it was out of sight. Hmm. That's curious, isn't it? Because one side will make you taller, one side will make you shorter, and yet the mushroom is round. And so what happens next? Alice remained looking thoughtfully at the mushroom for a moment, trying to make out which were the two sides, as it was perfectly round. She found this a very difficult question. However, at last she stretched her arms around it as far as they would go, broke off a bit of the edge with each hand, and now which is which, she said to herself, 
and nibbled a little of the right hand bit to try the effect. And the next moment, she felt a violent blow underneath her chin. It had struck her foot. Can you imagine? Her chin had struck her foot. She had shrunk very quickly. Now, she was a good deal frightened by this very sudden change, but she felt that there was no time to be lost as she was shrinking rapidly. So she set to work at once to eat some of the other bit. Her chin was pressed against so closely against her foot that there was hardly room to open her mouth. But she did it at last and managed to swallow a morsel of the left-hand bit <laughs> of the magic mushroom. And then what happened? Come, my head's free at last, said Alice in a tone of delight, which changed into alarm in another moment when she found that her shoulders were nowhere to be found. All she could see when she looked down was an immense length of neck would seem to rise like a stalk out of a sea of green grass that lay far below her. What can all that green stuff be, said Alice, and where have my shoulders got to, and oh, my poor hands, how is it I can't see you? She was moving them about as she spoke, but no result seemed to follow except a little shaking among the distant green leaves. Now, the caterpillar who will eventually change and fly into a parallel universe as a looking for a little, butterfly <laughs> induces Alice to eat the magic mushroom. This is what it is, a magic mushroom. And if you feel that what happened to her after she ate the magic mushroom was a description of a psychedelic trip, you'd be joined by many literary experts who feel the same way. But who would know that you're taking your children into the movies to see and eating popcorn that the little lady on the screen was on a psychedelic trip? Take a drug, Jim. Let me present you with a review of Alice in Wonderland, only because probably no one has ever told you this. And this is the startling thing. No one has ever said anything about this before. You had to come into this little room to find out about little Alice. And then, a little later, when you find out who little Alice really was, it gets curiouser and curiouser. Just waiting for you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but what we have seen all of our lives looking at Alice in Wonderland, we do not understand. You see? And this is exactly what Jesus was saying in the Bible. They look and they look, but they don't see. Now, this is a review of Alice in Wonderland taking into consideration the known mind of its author, Lewis Carroll, who incidentally had a different name. We'll get to that. Now, keep in mind, and this is why I'm doing this tonight here in our work approaching 2012. Alice in Wonderland is like religion. People get very upset when you tell them the truth of what the Bible really means. And it is the same with the story of Alice in Wonderland. There's many people just rush to the defense of Lewis Carroll and his reputation in the book. And the reason for that is because the story has become such a tradition that people would rather not know. And this will give you, 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 you some idea. And, and here's what you're going to see. You're not going to see a review of Alice in Wonderland, but you're going to see an analysis. And this analysis is supported by many people, and many people who support 
the uh, reputation of Lewis Carroll. Because Alice does not fall asleep to enter Wonderland, but instead falls very, very slowly down a rabbit hole, the audience understands that the trip she is about to take is not a dream in the normal sense. At the bottom of the rabbit hole, Alice encounters a door, the door to her mind, which she has to open to enter Wonderland, a drug reference. Alice must first drink a mind-altering substance to get small. The dangers of drug experimentation are hinted at when the door tells Alice that if she takes too much, she'll go out like a candle. Now, in the next one. From this point, there's a series of encounters between Alice and bizarre characters, each of which stands in for either a fragment of her newly adjusted mind or of her perception of the world around her. We'll examine a few of the most interesting. In the woods, Alice encounters Tweedledum and Tweedledee. They appear harmless at first, but it becomes apparent that they represent the twin evils of depression and more depression when they refuse to let Alice go on her way. The brothers Tweedle make evil grins when Alice isn't looking and entice her into hearing the depressing story of the walrus and the carpenter. You know, I mean, as, as you start to, to see, and then you say, well, now wait a minute, am I going to take the characters in this uh, story as figments of my mind and, and different parts of my mind. And, and that's what uh, the general analysis, whether these Tweedledum and Tweedledee represents the twin evils of depression. Let's look at the next one. The story involves a walrus and a carpenter who are so out of it that they don't know night from day. They sing about feeling like kings because their brains are turned to cabbages and then get such a serious case of the munchies that they devour a bunch of children. This same attractive things can turn you on theme is also present when Alice encounters a garden full of beautiful flowers that are at first friendly but then turn on her when they find out she is not one of them. Okay, let's, let's take a look at the next. A bizarre but unique character, the Cheshire Cat, appears at several points in the film, standing in for the state of Alice's mind and highlighting it by fading in and out of existence and giving her meaningless instructions. At one point, the cat makes clear that Alice herself is not one of the sane ones as she thinks of herself when he reacts to her saying she doesn't want to be among mad people by saying, we all go a little mad sometimes. I gotta, I, I, we got we to gotta either rent this movie or, or go again. From her first meeting with the Cheshire cat, Alice moves on to the mad tea party at which she finds the Mad Hatter and the March Hare, even though the Cheshire Cat had said that these two were to be found in different directions, along with an extremely strung out Dormouse. The Hatter and Hare are imbibing mass quantities, as head expansion expert Balder puts it, as part of an unbirthday celebration, a day in which one celebrates being unborn or mentally returned to the womb to be part of the universe, such as the star child at the end of 2001, Space Odyssey. I just think, before we went, who the heck knew this? Who, who had any concept of this? Who knew that this whole thing was a psychedelic drug trip? The white rabbit intervenes on the tea party, complaining about the time, as usual, and the rabbit's pocket watch, representing the last vestiges of mechanistic accuracy and objectivity in Wonderland, is summarily dissected by the Mad Hatter, 
Its works literally jammed and then smashed. Alice has broken the final chain with reality and can now become one with Wonderland. And the rest is just one drug mind trip reference after another. A scene in which a caterpillar smoking a pipe in a professorly manner while sitting on a mushroom with magic powers gives Alice a spelling lesson. <laughs> now I'm going to share with you one other comment by another writer, and this is just one uh, one slide. But you know, I just I just thought that his was comments were pretty good too. Alice meets the famous caterpillar, which is sitting upon a mushroom, smoking out of a hookah. Opium use was common, and Lewis Carroll wanted to explain the numerous benefits of using it. He focuses on using Alice to experience different drugs that alter certain things without showing her as becoming paranoid. On page four, Alice sees the bottles and sees that the sign is very attractive to her. It seems that Alice is experienced with drug use because, again, she is not scared by the effect. She just analyzes and accepts it. What a curious feeling, says Alice. In the Dark Ages, they lived in fear of religious government, and, and still that exists in different parts of the world. And, it, and, it, and if, if you look at the background of Lewis Carroll, you find strange things about him, and I'll show you where the impact of religious government comes in. You'll find many people trying to cover for Lewis Carroll. Oh, he just liked to write about nonsense. Oh, this is just a fantasy. Because they wanted to protect his reputation. And here's the problem. There were many references to Lewis Carroll's improper behavior, which included drug use and pedophilia. And if you look at encyclopedia references, there's an abundance of suggestions about Lewis Carroll. This is him. That's a picture of him. And, and, and his real name was Charles Lutwidge Dodson, who was born on the 27th of January, 1832, died on the 14th of January, 1898, better known by the pen name Lewis Carroll. He was an English author, mathematician, logician, Anglican, and photographer. His most famous writings are Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and its sequel, Through the Looking Glass. Okay. He was for many years widely assumed to have derived his own Alice from Alice Little. This was given some apparent substance by the fact the acrostic poem at the end of Through the Looking Glass spells out her name and that there are many superficial references to her hidden in the text of both books. The point is, just like the Bible, when you read things and you have other people tell you what the words mean, keep in mind that nobody was in the mind of this man and what he meant or what he thought. You have no concept of that. In 1856, Dodson took up the new art form of photography. Roger Taylor calculates that just over 50% of his surviving work depicts young girls. His studies of nude children were long presumed lost, but six have since surfaced, five of which have been published. Mm, that's what he did. Okay. The subject's a suggestion of drug use made him extremely popular to the counterculture of the 60s often being utilized by drug users as a positive way 
of showing the mainstream that one of their most famous and highly regarded writers also used these forbidden substances. Okay. You, you know, and, and, and sometimes you almost don't want to say this because everybody, you know, it's about every kid you walk into their playroom has the book Alice in Wonderland. You say, say well, you know, nobody knows. And that's just it. It's the same thing as when you have the Bible. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. There she is. That's Alice Little. 11 years old. And a page or two was torn out of the diary of Lewis Carroll in which he proposed marriage to that child. You want to, I'm not sure if there's, go ahead. Dodgson's friendships with young girls, together with his perceived lack of interest in romantic attachments to adult women, in psychological readings of his work, especially his photographs of nude or semi-nude girls, have all led to speculation that he was, in modern parlance, a pedophile. Let me see what else says. So in this next one, it says, We cannot know to what extent sexual urges by, lay behind Charles' preference for drawing. Let me use that word Charles. That's his real name, Charles Dobson. For drawing and photographing children in the nude. He contended the preference was entirely aesthetic, but given his emotional attachment to children, as well as his aesthetic appreciation of their forms, his assertion that his interest was strictly artistic as naive, he probably felt more than he dared acknowledge even to himself. You know, even up to the present time, you'll find people who comment on various sites that will come to the defense of Lewis Carroll and try to cover over the suspicions about him. And, and why, you know, you, you'd wonder why was there such an effort. But there is another part of his background that might explain. It's consistent with what we see with people up into this very time. Why would people cover over the fact that he was into, you know, drugs with little children and that he had this obsession with little girls. Most of Dodson's ancestors were army officers or Church of England clergymen. His great-grandfather, also Charles Dodson, had risen through the ranks of the church to become a bishop. Young Charles' father was an active and highly conservative clergyman of the Anglican Church, who involved himself sometimes influentially in the intense religious disputes that were dividing the Anglican Church. He was high church, inclining towards Anglo-Catholicism, and he did his best to instill such views into his children. And there's your answer. <laughs> Anything at all costs to hide the lifestyle of this upstanding Christian author. No upstanding Christian could ever be connected with drugs and pedophilia. <laughs> but what does it all mean? What difference does it make to anything? If someone reads Alice in Wonderland and, and simply enjoys it as a type of nonsense fantasy, what does it hurt? The answer is nothing. It really hurts absolutely nothing. But what it does, and that's why I raised the issue, what it does is to show all of us how things written can be presented to the masses of people in such a way 
as to disguise their true meaning. And everybody runs off and buys the little book for their little children and takes them to the movie and everything. And that's fine. And they see the cat and they see the rabbit. And it's fine and it's cute. And so what if this guy had some distorted view? Was Lewis Carroll speaking in coded terms about taking drugs and their bizarre effects in the story of Alice in Wonderland? Well, the majority of people who say absolutely. And was Alice, the 11-year-old Alice Little, whose picture you saw, was the one he proposed marriage to, and she's 11 years old, was that portrayed? Was she Alice in Wonderland? And if so, what type of relationship did he force on her? Was his infatuation with nude female children in any way portrayed? But mainly, here's the point, and this is the only point that's interesting to me. I don't care about the story. I mean, if people see it and they, they, their children enjoy it and they enjoy it, yeah, it's irrelevant. But my concern, did you have any idea about this? All the years that you've known about Alice in Wonderland, did it ever cross your mind that this could be a serious case of pedophilia and about, you know, children and drugs and all that stuff? Do you think that Walt Disney would have dove so deeply into the fantasy if they knew? I don't think they would have. So, what does all of this say about what we think we know? In all honesty, we're told by some people what the Bible means. Written by people who were into mythology 2,000 years ago, and yet today, hardly anybody knows what Alice in Wonderland means. Written just a hundred years ago. Okay. <laughs> Joan and I were in a restaurant a couple of days ago. I was a young fellow there, young boy, school boy from around here. And I started kidding around and talking to him. And I asked him if he ever heard of Paul Revere. Oh, yes, he said. He knew all about it. Paul Revere wrote and, and told everybody the British are coming, the British are coming. Well, when I told him, no, it wasn't Paul Revere, that Paul Revere was a fraud, he, he ran and grabbed his paper and he's writing down, who was it? Because he wants to go into school and stand up and, and tell everybody that Paul Revere was a phony. Hmm. I told him it was not Paul Revere who made that famous ride. It was Israel Bissell. So he wrote that down. And you know, the thing is this. We've all been... To he, he, he told that the teachers at school, you know, it's, they, Paul Revere, they revived... We're taught by the teachers that it was Paul Revere. And it wasn't. Even our educational school system knew nothing of Israel Bissell. But here he is. Israel Bissell's Ride, 1778. His name was Israel Bissell, and he is one of the Revolutionary War's most unheralded heroes. Bissell, a 23-year-old postal rider, when the war broke out on April 19, 1775, rode day and night with little sleep during an exhausting 345-mile journey from Boston's western edge to Philadelphia. To arms, to arms, the war has begun, Bissell shouted as he passed through each little town. Dozens of other messengers also raced on horseback, making it likely that Paul Revere was a composite 
of these brave men, said J.L. Bell, a Massachusetts writer who specializes in Revolutionary War era writing. In response to their cries, church bells were rung and muskets were fired. The British were attacking. The Revolutionary War had begun, but there were no bells pealing for Israel Bissell, whose ride was obscured in history's annals by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem of Paul Revere. Longfellow's poem, Paul Revere's Ride, became familiar to generations of American schoolchildren because it was a more dramatic story. Very few people know about poor Israel because Longfellow did not write a poem about him, said Kay Westcott, a librarian at the Watertown Free Library. Robert Thompson, a Syracuse University professor, said Longfellow's poem marginalized Bissell's accomplishments and magnified Paul Revere for reasons that had little to do with fact. History is built on facts, but Thompson noted that facts can be overwhelmed by the fame spawned by culture, art, and fiction. Now, not only did Israel Bissell not get credit for making the ride that he made, but the educational system taught everybody and all of us that Paul Revere did it. They were, I mean, they're standing there in the schoolroom teaching a lie. The guy was a phony, a fraud. So then what? The Bible is called the Word of God, but who said so? Who, who said it is? Alice in Wonderland is a children's fantasy. <laughs> no, it's something much different. And Paul Revere alerted the colonies to the British attack. You know, there was a famous writer in American music. His name was George Gershwin. He wrote a lot of uh, popular songs. But he was also a classical writer, and I, and I put him into the place of not only pop music but classics because he, was, he composed American in Paris and Rhapsody in Blue. But he wrote a song, the line that I love, and I want to share it with you now. This is what he said. It ain't necessarily so. It ain't necessarily so. The things that you're liable to read in the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. George Gershwin. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. I'm going to put this in. If nobody ever told you the truth about Alice in Wonderland, if nobody ever told you the truth about Paul Revere, what makes you think they're going to tell you the truth about the Bible? If you don't know the truth about Paul Revere, how the heck are you going to know the truth about Jesus? Think about that. And who tells the truth? You know, people strive to make sure that their individual religious corporations thrive. And yet even the Bible that, you know, was held, you know, as the word of God and all this stuff has warnings about religious people. Watch this. Jeremiah 5.31, the prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by what the prophets say. In other words, the religious people that come out and say, here's the word of the Lord, the prophet said this, and the Bible is saying, but what that prophet said is a bunch of crap. And my people love to have it that way. And what will you do in the end when you find out you don't know what the heck's going on. 
Then the Lord said to me, the prophets prophesied lies in my name. I didn't send them. I didn't tell them to do anything. I didn't speak to them. They prophesy to you a false vision and things that are worthless, and it comes from the deceit of their heart. See? Now you think about that. Because the people will say, well, Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. <laughs> According to the Bible, the prophets are a bunch of phonies. And it, it can take all of the wind out of you because it, it can make you feel, hey, you know, is anybody telling truth? And you know what the answer is? No. No, nobody tells the truth. I don't know if you've heard the latest from John Edwards, the vice president. If you didn't hear it, he very clean-cut good-looking guy and his wife's got cancer. Well, he's, there's a baby someplace else and he's been involved. And, I, you know, that's, that's just people. And I, and I, you know, I can I totally accept that because, you know, people make mistakes and, or people feel that this is, they're doing the right thing and they go and do it and it turns out wrong. I can't blame people for that. The problem that I have is all right, but don't set yourself up as something for other people. You know, this is the ideal way to live. Well, you know, just shut up. Jimmy Swagger gets his bandana and his shower clogs and jumps over the fence because to lose motel, gets whatever he's got to get done and comes back and tells everybody, you're going to hell. Yeah, stop. And that's what this means. That's what this means. They're, they're phonies. Goodness. I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking religion. I'm reading the Bible here, Albert. The word of the Lord. Don't listen to the words of the prophets that prophesy to you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart, and they do not speak the word of the Lord. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? They are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. And this is what it's saying, see? And it happens all the time. And you can watch them on television today. I mean, you know, the, the, the guy, Ted Haggard, he was out there preaching to thousands of people the, the evils of homosexuality, and then he'd run down and, and, and get this erotic massage from this uh, weightlifter and this gay guy. I mean, you know, it's all, that's, he fits right in, then. So how can you know anybody? And that, you know what this all comes down to? Whether it be Alice in Wonderland, whether it be Paul Revere, whether it be the stuff we're seeing here, the only place that you're ever going to be guided in the truth and in the proper way is through here, inside of yourself. I think there's one more here. I think it comes from uh, Ezekiel. Trouble will come to the foolish prophets that follow their spirit and have seen nothing. And, and, and that's the point of all of this stuff. And that's, that's why I'm standing here doing all of this and, and, and talking about it. I mean, I didn't come in here to knock Alice in Wonderland. I don't, you know, I don't want to make anybody, oh, you know, you're going to ruin the story for me. You know? and, and that's basically what the concept of, of the Bible was saying. So my people love to have it that way. Just let us have the story. Don't tell us what it means. Just let us have the Bible. Let us kiss the Bible. Let us put it on the piano. Don't tell us what it really means. And what does it say? My people love to have it that way. It was a guy that uh, I wrote, uh, I read in the, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of him. His name is John Kaminsky. But he said, what happens to you when you know that what you have believed in all of your life 
in the deepest recesses of your heart is false. It wasn't true. So, and that's where you, you get to the point of like Pachavotan saying, you know, the time now is, is coming upon the time of change. Could, I don't know if it would raise you. Could you believe, and I'm not talking about Democrats, Republicans, I don't care. Could you believe anything that anybody on either side or anything in the government says to you? No. You couldn't. No. Absolutely not. Nothing. And there's even a story now that uh, they had uh, somebody forge a letter about the attack on Iraq or, because the spy they had come back and said, there is no weapons of mass destruction. And they grabbed this guy. They gave him $5 million and shipped him off somewhere to shut up and, and, and then had him forge a thing saying there was. So how can you believe anybody about anything? You base your whole lot, all of our lies, on lies. And then we, we get to the point where you wonder, you know, why things are bad. You can, t you know, shut that down. Is that going to be any more? Ernest Becker said, once you base your life on lies and then in, try to implement that lie, you instrument your own undoing. You see? And, and this, he says it's, it's like taking candy away from a baby. The candy's no good for him, but it's going to take him a lot of years to realize the favor you did. In the meantime, he's going to whine about how mean you are and how wrong it was that you did that. But when he's a healthy adult, because of the thing you took away, he may develop the judgment and wisdom to thank you. And in any case, Becker says he'll be a heck of a lot healthier. And so, can you take away from these people their, uh, their love of the Word of God and their love of, of uh, Jesus and all of these? Can you pull that away? It's like they're candy. Okay. And, and, and can you say then to people, you know, this is not good for anybody because history has shown that it fosters so much hate between differing groups. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you can go look down a list of ancient gods of, you know, mythology born of virgins, born on December 25th, killed, resurrected. I mean, there's n numerous ones. And yet, it depends on which group says, well, no, 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 the Jesus is the real one. They're all liars. And then the other one says, no, we're the right one. They're all uh, Satan or whatever they call us. And then you're in the middle running around saying, well, you know, why do we spend so much time shooting each other and killing each other? And it, and, it, and, it, and it festers out of this thing with beliefs. You protect your beliefs at all costs. And so what do we do today? We sat here and we brought you two situations that you have known all of your lives and somebody comes like me today and with the information I gave to you and snatches it away from you and says, no, Alice in Wonderland is not a children's story. It was written by a pedophile who took pictures of nude young child girls and wrote about psychedelic drug trips. So, so uh, uh, what I've done here, I've taken your, you, you know, your innocence away. I've taken Alice in Wonderland. My God, what's next? And then Israel Bissell. 
He jumped on his horse and blew his whistle, the midnight ride of Israel Bissell. I mean, you know, is nothing sacred? <laughs> You've taken Paul Revere away. After our teachers have taught us every day in the classroom the midnight ride of Paul Revere by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, you're saying the guy's a fraud. Oh, you've taken it away. But you see, as you start taking away all of these things that you thought were true, then you open yourself up to the truth. You know, it's a system that every living thing in the universe is governed by people who don't tell the truth. And you know what? Every living thing in the universe is perfectly satisfied with it. It's fine. It's fine. No problem. They don't stop to think, why are so many people get cancer and nobody can cure it? Why do so many people die at, at, you know, like infants at 80, 90 years old when they should be living to be 500? How come? They don't realize that it's because the system has kept from you and me and the rest of the world the truth about the things that Wotan tried to express, our need to be in harmony with nature instead of raping it and destroying it, our need to be in harmony with life instead of bombing it and killing it, and our need to reach out with healing for everybody instead of putting a price tag on it. It's often said, uh, you know, that uh, instinct is stronger than reason. And, and, and you know, I, 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 I always thought that it's just the opposite, that we have lost our instinct. And we've talked about that, of how, uh, you know, the animals seem to be uh, knowledgeable in, in some strange way that when some terrible thing is going to happen, they, they go away. You know, you think about that. You don't even generally... When they have earthquakes and all that stuff, you don't even generally see dead rats or anything. Everybody takes off. It's an instinct. It's, it's God. It's the light of God. It takes them safely out of the way of danger. And we who read the Bibles and sing the songs stand there and the wave comes in and washes you out. And you don't have any, any idea whatsoever. So, it, you know, if, if you're content... In, in having people tell you all of these lies and you live your life based on the lies of others, then that's it. And you know something? Whatever we've talked about here, there are people who will watch this and who will scream bloody murder because they don't want anybody at any time challenging their traditional beliefs. You know, they know. They didn't know Paul Revere didn't make that ride, but they know about Jesus. They, well, because they taught us in church. Well, they also taught you in school about Paul Revere. <laughs> well, anyhow, this was kind of different because we spent a, a lot of time in analyzing the mind of someone who wrote a very famous story. And, and, and we looked beyond his mind into his personhood to try to find out what kind of a person he was. And it surprised us and kind of shocked us because all of our lives, and some of them are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, we've never, ever knew this. And this is what's going to come down as we get closer to December 21st, 2012. What will come down is suddenly we'll begin to understand, and even people who hold the strongest allegiance to these ancient traditions 
will begin to understand that uh, these things were destructive, hurtful, and kept us from life, and kept us from love, and kept us from restoration back to the creation and creator uh, of this magnificent planet. So we'll see how this goes, and, and we just keep uh, uh, looking at it as we get closer. And, uh, you, you know, if, if you take nothing else after you watch this or if you take nothing else from it after you leave this room, uh, you, you just have to, I hope, remember those famous words of uh, George Gershwin. The things that you're liable to read in the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. But, and I'll conclude with this, read it and then say, if it ain't necessarily so, that what I thought it meant, what does it really mean? And you'll never be able to have any teacher tell you. You'll never be able to have any preacher tell you. The only truth that you'll ever find is lodged right where the Jesus of the Bible said it was within you. We'll see you. Thank you. Bye-bye.